Well, I won't hold you too long. Come with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Paul says, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. Another translation may say covetousness. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and all, in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. But then he goes on to say, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, and whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Well, I want to talk to you just for these few moments from the subject. Um, and with this thought in mind, living life on a new level. Amen. Living life on a new level. Now, those of you who have been coming with and studying with us, uh, be it virtual or in person, you know that we have been walking through the entire letter of the Colossians. Isn't that right? Yeah. You know that we started in chapter 1, and we are now here in chapter 3. And you remember on last Sunday, we, uh, we had a good talk, a good study about what it means to walk with God, what it means to live the Christian life. Uh, and we titled that, remember, we titled that lesson, What on Earth Are You Looking For? You remember, you remember, Paul says, here's what the child of God must do. Now that you are in Christ, you need to now seek those things above and then set your mind and your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. And so that's where we get the title from. What on earth are you looking for? The child of God should never be looking for things on the earth. You should never set your affections for things on the earth. Why? Because all of the things on the earth will at some point when God gets ready to, uh, to burn up and, and, and destroy, this world will be no more. So we need to make sure that our focus, our centeredness is on heaven itself. And you remember, I told you that when the child of God sets their affections on heavenly things, you then become one who thinks heavenly. You think heaven bound. You think your affections, your, your love, your, your where, where, the things that you do as a child of God are all influenced by heaven itself. Well, now Paul would say, if you're going to live life on a new level, and, and every child of God should, because you now have a new life in Christ. If you're going to live life on a new level, then there are some things you're going to have to do in your faith walk with the Lord. See, oftentimes we believe uh, in the misnomer that God does it all for us. Well, I need you to understand, God did his part when he gave Jesus on the cross. You then must accept him by faith, but then that's not all. I'm not talking about works of righteousness. I'm not talking about meritorious works, anything that you do that would merit your, uh, your, some entitlement with God. I'm talking about what you do as a child of God that would bring honor and glory to the name of God. Are y'all tracking with me? Because the moment you start to think that what I do, my work in, in, in the kingdom of God, when you think that that is what, uh, what merits something from God, then that would mean your works, because of your works, God owes you something. 
Now, who in here would be willing to say, because of what I do in the kingdom, God owes me heaven? Who would be willing to say, so what you do as a child of God is all uh, an outflowing of your understanding of salvation and what, uh, how much you love the Savior. Amen. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Amen. You don't do what you do, and some Christians do it only because it's commanded. You've got to grow in your faith. Living life on a new level says I get past what is commanded. I understand what is commanded. But now I'm going to do what I do because there is a Savior who died for me and he loves me and I love him right back. Y'all with me? So now Paul says, listen, as a child of God, if you're going to live life on a new level, then here's what you need to understand. You need to understand your position as a child of God on this new level. That new level is that I have been, my, my affections have been uh, centered on heaven. I have now been raised because in chapter 2 verse 11, you remember, he told the saints there that you have been buried with him. You have been circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands. You have now been buried with him and by faith in the operation of God, which means now when I am buried with him, when I put faith in the Lord Jesus, I'm buried with the Lord Jesus in baptism. God operates. He cuts away the sins of the flesh, but then God doesn't leave us there. He then raises us with Christ. Ephesians 2, 6 would say Jesus is seated on the right hand of the Father, and so are we. We are Christians are elevated to heavenly to a heavenly realm. You live in a new realm now. You live as and you ought to your life, should I say, ought to reflect where you live. Oh, y'all ain't catching that. Your life ought to reflect where you live. There are no, I better not say that. You know how you, you ever you ever, you ever had people say, I'm a product of my environment? Well, you ever heard people say that? That I'm a product of my environment? In some ways, that's true, right? But that shouldn't be an excuse for you to live the way you live. Right. Are y'all tracking what I'm saying? Yes, well, here's what I really want to say to you. There are some people who actually, their life reflects where they live. Yeah. Let me give it to you another way. That was kind of hard, wasn't it? There are some Christians whose life reflect the people they've been around. Are y'all following what I'm saying? We, we look, as a matter of fact, there, uh, there's a saying that um, you are a reflection of the five closest people you hang around. Y'all ever thought about that? We all get real quiet. So think about it in your personal life. Whoever you hang around the most will probably have some level of influence on you. Right? They'll have some level of influence on your thinking, some level of, and, and ultimately some level of influence on your behavior. So think about who you hang around the most, who you consider the most influential in your life. And I guarantee you, some way, shape, or form, you talk like that person, you mimic that person, right? You, you may even think in some ways like that person. All right, y'all still ain't feeling that. All right, think of mama. Think of your mother, right? Think of the person dearest to you. And think about how those characteristics have spilled off into your life, right? Think about how if mama was loving, think about how that spilled off into your life and you're, you, you love just like mama loved, all right? Y'all with me? Oh, okay, y'all still ain't say okay. Now, uh, no, I better not use that one. Let's move on, let's move on. So you reflect who you hang around. You reflect, um, uh, you are influenced by the things you intake. That's why it's so important for young people to be careful at the people they hang around and the things they put into their heart. Are y'all tracking with me? So now, um, and, and then, and then before I, the, the young people think that I'm beating them up, I'm not. Because sometimes the young people, what they get is from sometimes the people that's supposed to be their parents. The attitude, the, the conversation, the way they, they behave, sometimes it isn't always a reflection of their classmates and peers. Sometimes it's the folk right in the house with them. 
Well, Paul says, listen, if you're going to live life on a new level, there are some things you're going to have to put to death. Are y'all with me? There must be some things. Now, notice what he says. He says, now, therefore, since you have your members are, uh, consider your earthly members as dead to what, though? Immorality, right? And another translation would say fornication, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Now, I'll just tell you, jump ahead, covetousness is really the basis for all the other sins. Let me tell you, covetousness is the uncontrollable desire to possess things. But now, let me just do you one better. Covetousness can be the uncontrollable to desire to even possess people. Now, I'm not talking about demon possession. I'm talking about to have. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Covetousness is the basis for all the other sins. Think about that. If it's an uncontrollable desire to have, then usually what happens when you look at, have y'all ever watched the show American Greed? Y'all ever, ever seen that? American Greed? Usually what happens? That person, they, 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 they have a desire for, and a hunger for money, right? And usually what happens they end up in thievery. They end up deceiving people. They end up taking people's life savings and earnings. Why? They end up in these Ponzi schemes. Here's why. Because the covetous desire to have money leads them to greed and ultimately leads them to theft. Y'all follow what I'm saying? It's the basis. Think of fornication. It's the desire to have sexually. Y'all follow what I'm saying? It's a, uh, and then it can be seen in an uncontrollable desire. It comes from the basis of covetousness. Adultery comes from the uncontrollable desire of having someone that's not your spouse. Y'all ain't, y'all getting real. It, it comes from that. Un, so you, matter of fact, in that, what you see is Idolatry. That's why Paul says, really, it's really, it leads to idolatry because it's the worship of self. Are y'all following what I'm saying? It's what you want for you. And usually what happens in a marriage or relationships when a marriage is dissolved or it ends in divorce, it usually is because one or both parties adopted the spirit of covetousness. They want it for themselves and not the well-being of their spouse. Are y'all tracking with me? Yes. And so covetousness, church, is the basis. So usually, it isn't necessarily unreconcilable differences. Usually, it's because somebody decided to be selfish. Yes. Right? Covetousness. So it, it is the uncontrollable desire to possess things. And this is the, this, the idolatry of the mind and the heart. Here it is, church. So it takes place where? In the heart. That's why when Jesus told the disciples in, in Matthew 6, 33, remember he said, seek uh, the kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added. And then remember just before that, he said, be careful at, at, at the lure of money. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having money. Nothing wrong with that, church. There is absolutely nothing wrong with having financial wealth. The problem is when that wealth has you. Y'all with me? And so Jesus then says, here's why you got to be careful. Because where your heart, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, right? So, church, it's the affections that all take place, this desire, and let me be clear, all desire isn't bad. Well. God placed in us a people with desire. You follow what I'm saying? So desire in and of itself isn't bad. It's when it becomes uncontrollable with the spirit of covetousness. Let me do you one better. This, this, this sin is so dangerous, church, that you can be so covetousness, that covetous in your spirit, that you will, uh, it, well, when Ron buys a new car, 
I'm so I become jealous. Instead of celebra celebrating what Ron, uh, celebrating is a cup, I become jealous and then I want what Ron has. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And then I go run out and get that car because I want to, uh, because I'm covetous, I want what Ron has, knowing full well Fred can't afford it. You see the danger? <laughs> y'all should, y'all try to act like y'all, y'all something else. That, but that covetousness, so now what I want you to get, covetousness, the spirit, the uncontrollable desire of having or, or, or wanting things. It can also be in you wanting someone. You follow what I'm saying? So it leads to all the other sin. It's the basis for it. So then Paul says, notice what he says. He says, so you need to remember that the members of your body are dead to these things. Right? You, God has given you a new life. He's giving you a fresh beginning, right? So why would you want to go back to the very stuff that entangled you? Y'all seeing that? Notice what he says. He says, "Your earth, consider the members of the earthly body as dead, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Now, when he talks about impurity, uncleanness, it, it has to do with moral and mental uncleanness which also leads to the debasement of uh, sexual, um, sexual wantonness, if you will, right? It leads to unclean. You remember when, when uh, Paul would say in Romans that God gave those over to a reprobate mind? Y'all remember he said, and, he gave, and then the Bible says he gave them over, God gave them over to all levels of uncleanness. It led to a debasement of moral uncleanness. Uh, you get the point, right? Yeah. I'm trying to keep this G-rated. Y'all right. get the yeah. All right. Okay. So he says, he says, all of this, you are dead too, because you live life on a new level. You are not the same person that you used to be. You are now someone completely new. And here's the other thing, church. No, as a child of God, no, I don't have the old man still and the new man living together. No, when God cleans you up, when God saves you through Christ, you are clean and completely clean. You are the new you. The problem is some of us are going back and pulling the old man out of the grave and choosing to live with the old man and the new self. You follow what I'm saying? That's a contradiction. So now he says... For, all, for it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Now, if that doesn't cause you to live right, I don't think anything else will. It's really self-explanatory. He says, listen, those who practice such a lifestyle, he says the wrath of God is upon those who are disobedient, right? He ain't talking about church a, a mere stumbling and you struggle and you, you fall and you get back up. He's talking about people who live this way and they practice this kind of lifestyle. You know, they have made up in their minds that this is how they're going to live no matter what God says, no matter what's in the word, no matter what fellow Christians uh, say to steer them in the right direction. They're going to live how they want to on their own terms. Right? So he says, just know that the wrath of God comes upon uh, those of disobedience. Then, he says the second reason under why you ought to remember that you're dead to all of this is because, look at verse 7, in them you once walked when you were living in them. So he says, listen, there are two things that ought to deter you from living your old life. Number one, that the wrath of God is upon children of disobedience. Secondly, remember, this is how you used to live. Matter of fact, the way you used to live should be so distasteful that you don't want anything else to do with your former life. Are y'all seeing that? He said, it ought, to, it, ought to, it ought to be, matter of fact, I was talking, I, I know someone close to me who used to be an addict for about 20 years, about 20 plus years. And one of the things that he shared with me he said, man, when I, when I fell to the bottom bottom, and uh, he said, he didn't, it was something, he ended up in the hospital, 
And it was something that the doctors gave him that took away, that, that it, it distorted the taste of drug. He said he doesn't know what it was. It just could have been the medicine to rehabilitate him. But whatever it was, it helped take the taste out. And he said, so now, whenever I even, whenever I, if I'm in close proximity of someone who, who is using drugs, he says it makes him sick on his stomach. That he wants nothing to do with it. Well, church, if you can understand that concerning the drug addict, then you ought to be able to understand that even more when it comes to your former life. When it comes to your former life, your past, that stuff, what you used to do, who you ran with, all of that ought to make you sick to your spiritual stomach. It ought to make you, it, it ought to make you so bad, it, it ought to make you feel so bad. But here's the other thing. It ought to make you feel bad because how it hurts God. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So he says, listen, two things. The, the, the wrath of God is upon the children of disobedience. And then the second deterrent, remember that you used to live like this. This is something you used to be. Well, this is how you used to be. Well, this is how you used to think. Y'all well, follow what I'm saying? So that's your, that's your position as the child of God. Now, notice the progress of the child of God. Verse 8, he says, but now you also put them all aside. Now notice the list. He says, put aside. Your progress as a child of God should be that I'm putting to death, putting aside anger. Y'all well, see that? Wrath well, and malice. And here's how it flows. Anger, wrath, and malice. Right? Anger comes from the Greek word orge. And it describes the wrath of a man that leads him to act or speak rashly. It is that hot, uncontrollable pride that swells up when you're offended. Now watch wrath. Wrath, thumos, is when anger is allowed to stew and fume. You ever heard people say, look, if so-and-so say one more word to me. Look, when I get to this job... It's going to be something if so-and-so run up on me. Y'all ain't, y'all trying to act like y'all, y'all just hope. Y'all know some, y'all know somebody who's gotten on your nerve. You even know some family members that rub you and you say, I'm telling you, if you run up on me again, this ain't what you want. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Some of them say, well, you know, I, I want them to let them know I'm about that life. Wrath, <laughs> but what has happened? It's due from anger. You were bawling over. And then you know what we do now. We cover it. We, now when we go off, then we say, you know what? I ain't mean to say that. Yes, you did. You know, I, you know what? You made me. I'm trying to act like I, I'm trying to be a Christian. I'm trying not to go there with you. You know you meant to go there because it was in your mind. All it was was stewing and brawl and bawling a little bit. Then when it reaches its boiling point, it leads to wrath. And boy, you done gone there and you can't pull it back. Well, right? Well. But, then, <laughs> but then, if you're not careful, if you don't control anger, anger is like the base, like, like covetousness, covetousness is to the, the other sins. Well, anger is like the base of malice. So now, it leads to malice, which is uh, the viciousness of character, right? Malice is that hateful attitude that will go beyond, now hear me carefully, it is that vicious attitude that will go beyond getting even, right? And it uh, and it go, it go seeks to do harm to an individual. That's malice. Y'all ever watch the, I, I like to watch the crime movie, y'all ever watch Snap and 48 Hours and stuff? You, you ever notice how that thing builds up? And in, in, in our mind, we're looking at it like, man, that was so senseless. Yeah. But the reality is, what happened, they allowed anger. That person allowed anger to, to resonate and to build up and fester and boil into wrath. Uh, uh, and then it led to malice. It led to them saying, you know what? Not only am I going to show you that you hurt me, but now I'm going to actually do what you did to me times 10. Y'all hearing that? I'm going to get back at you. M matter of fact, it goes a little further than you just keying somebody's car. 
Y'all get real quiet. Y'all, oh, somebody in the back must have been. Y'all must have been guilty of keying. It goes beyond you keying someone's car to you being so malice in your heart that you're really you're willing to either kill them by shooting them or burning them to death or just or just torturing the person. That's malice. I mean, and, and matter of fact, you see this in sometimes uh, serial killers. Well, what they do is they stab a person. It, it, it wasn't enough for them to stab a person to kill them. They stab them about 50, 60 times, right? Malice. It came from anger, which led to wrath, which now is induced uh, from, or is seen in its fullest sense in, in malice. Well, it would suggest to me, church, that if Paul is telling the Christians that you need to put all of this aside, it presupposes that these Christians had this also in their heart. Isn't that right? Or else he wouldn't be telling them, put it aside. That makes sense? So here's what you got to be able to do. Now, what have we been talking about from chapter 1 up to this point? That Paul's primary message to the Christians is that Jesus is sufficient. He is all you need. Now, the moment church the moment you as a Christian stop believing and depending on the all-sufficiency of Christ, it will lead you to anger, malice, wrath, right? It'll, you'll engage in fornication, covetousness, all of these things. If you do not think, think about it. If I never thought that Jesus was sufficient enough to meet my needs, then uh, listen, then I'm going to always succumb to being covetous of what Ron had. But when I know who it is that meets my needs, whether it's good days or bad days, when I know who it is that covers me, when I know who it is that provides for me, then I don't have time to let the spirit of covetous into my heart because I realize God has blessed Ron and God, whenever he sees fit, will bless me too. You follow what I'm saying? So you, it doesn't allow you to have that kind of spirit. Now, he says, notice the next part, he says, so put it aside, anger, wrath, malice, and then watch what happens when you allow anger to fester and boil, he says it, it leads to the next phase, which is slander. Y'all see that? Yeah, slander is the killing off of another person's character verbally. So listen, if you don't, if you don't engage in in wrath and malice, well, usually a person that's angry, they'll do what? What's the next step they'll do? They'll slander you. Y'all follow what I'm saying? It all balls and stems from anger, slander. So he says, make sure you put that far from you because you now live life on a new level. You want to know when you are really mature? That's when someone has hurt you. You've really grown in Christ when someone has hurt you maliciously and then they come up to you and shake your hand and speak to you like you don't know anything that's going on, yet you still bless them. Yet you still shake their hand. And watch this. And you don't shake their hand just to get them out the way. You shake their hand because you know who it was that loved you. You know that at some point in time in my own life, I was slanderous to Jesus. By how I live. And as a result, I am not going to, uh, I'm not going to go tit for tat, if you will. Right? Slander. Not met, and, and that takes maturity, church. But it also takes you depending on the one who's sufficient. See, we in our in Bible class, we're talking about prayer, the power of the of the prayer life in the child of God. But think about it. Have you ever asked, have you really, really asked God to Bless you with the spirit of forgiveness. Bless you with self-control. So that, bless your tongue so that you aren't slanderous. Even though, watch this. Even though you have a constitutional and human right to get back at <laughs> Right? Yeah, but the reality is, because of who I am, I refuse to dishonor my Lord. That's really what the heart of this is. Watch this, watch this. He says, now, do not lie. He said, and then he said, put off abusive speech.
from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Why? Since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Are y'all seeing that? So look at the progress. So he's saying we are being renewed. That's what he, really what he's saying. And then he says this new possession that we have leads us to a new life. And then it's this quality of life that I now have that never existed before. Y'all tracking with me? You never had this kind of life. Now you may not have, you may not, may not drink, you may have not ever smoked, you may have never done what you, you know, you see other people, you claim other people do, right? Well, you know, you, you know well, what so-and-so well, did. Well, you know how we do. Well, but that didn't give you this quality of life. Just because you didn't do certain things doesn't mean you had always this quality of life. You didn't get this quality of life until you gave your life to Jesus. And you are unwilling to allow anybody to mess up that type of relationship that you have with Jesus. As a matter of fact, you are unwilling to compromise. I am who I am by the grace of God. And I am unwilling to allow the world and anybody else around me who doesn't want to walk with the Lord with me, I am unwilling to allow them to cause me to compromise my relationship with the Lord. Right? Oh, we're almost done, y'all. I promise you. Now he says, he says to them, he says, and have put on the new self who is being renewed. Now notice the partner, well we're getting to the partnership, That's, we're still in the progress. He says, your new self is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image, watch this, of the one who created you. So now you want to know purpose? Because I, you know, sometimes you get people to say, I hear people all the time say, look, I'm trying to find my purpose. Well, you don't want to know what God's purpose is for you? That you be renewed every day into the image of the one who saved you. That's, that's purpose. You, you see, oftentimes we think that it's about us uh, having a certain amount of worldly success. God's purpose, read, when you get a chance, go back and read Romans 8, 28. When Paul talks about those, uh, all things working together for good, to them who love God and have been called according to his purpose, then he'll let them know that it was God's purpose before the foundation of the world that all of us in Christ would be conformed to his image. Y'all looking at me like y'all don't believe it. Turn to Romans 8. I got to turn there. Y'all didn't say amen loud enough, so I got to prove it to you. I got to prove it to you. Let me prove it real quick. I was, I was almost done until y'all didn't say amen on this. Now notice verse 28. And we know... God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, right? To those who are called according to whose purpose? His purpose. His purpose. Now watch this. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Look at the form to the image of his son. Is that in y'all Bible? Yes, God's purpose was to have a people in Christ. And, when, and those in Christ are destined, have been predetermined. You Saved by the blood of Christ, everybody sitting in here who is a child of God, God predetermined you would look like Jesus. That's, what, that's the purpose. See, oftentimes we train our children that, yo, look, you, you will to be the next LeBron James, next, next Russell Wilson, or whoever the favorite athlete is, the next Tiger Woods in golf, right? Lil Wayne. Lil, or, or, or the next Lil All right. Wayne. All right. Young Z, Young Yeet, what is it, Young Yeezy? <laughs> y'all know what y'all is. Y'all yeah. get the point. <laughs> but, but really, what we should be teaching our young people is that you should ever strive to look like Jesus. Now, watch how this permeates in every aspect of life. When you start training young people that they ought to look like Jesus, then they'll know what to look for in a wife. She'll know what to look for in a husband. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Because the whole purpose is for them to be transformed like the very one who saved them. 
See, if you want to be a better mother or a better parent, whatever it is, a better supervisor, whatever it is, then strive to look more like Jesus. If you, if you want to change the environment around you and you want to be the influencer, then you strive to look like Jesus. The more you strive to look like him, it then begins to permeate into the lives of those that are around you. I know that to be true because the more you strive to look like Jesus, you will either be a magnet or a repeller. And so the people that really work good for your life will leave. Or the people who really want what you have in Christ will be drawn to you. You follow what I'm saying? So that begs another question. Then who are you drawing to? Am I drawing people who want the same thing that I want in terms of my spirituality? Or am I drawing people because I am not living according to the image of Christ? That makes sense? That's what his purpose is. Now, now Colossians, and I'm, well, I ain't get to all of this, so I'm going to have to save this to the next one. He says, you are being renewed to the image of the one who created you. And then he says a renewal in which there, watch the partnership we have. There is a renewal in which there is no distinction between, between Greek, between Jew, between circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian. Matter of fact, those who don't speak, they thought those who didn't speak Greek and uh, who weren't as educated as the Greek or, or, or like the Jews, they thought them, labeled them barbarian. Then he says, Scythians. Scythians were the most hated. Matter of fact, Scythian people were nomadic, but they were, they were some vengeful people. These were the kind of people who would kill you at the drop of a dime. That's, that were Scythians. They were hated. He says, but now notice, in Christ, you have these people. Y'all ain't missing the power. Y'all missing the power of this. In Christ, there is neither no barbarian, doesn't matter how articulate you are or not. It doesn't matter how Jewish you are in nature. It doesn't matter how, how educated you are as a Greek. It doesn't matter how hated you are by society. Y'all, in Christ, he said, there is no distinction. In Christ, God has leveled all of us and put us on equal playing field. Are y'all seeing this, church? So he says, that's why you got to be careful at judging people by what you see outwardly. You don't know what that person has been through. You don't know how God has delivered them and what he's delivered them from. And if you are, if you are just looking at people from your physical eye, then you'll be messed up every time. He says, he says, slave and free man, but in Christ, but Christ is in all and all. Y'all got that? Amen. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on. Now notice, here's your performance. The partnership, the partnership church is that we are all one in Christ. Then he says the performance is that you need to put on a heart of compassion. Y'all see it? Put on a heart of, uh, um, uh, of compassion because you, well, first, you've been chosen, you are holy, and you are beloved. Then he says, put on a heart of compassion, put on kindness, put on humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forbearing, being able to put up with other people. And then he says, forgiving one another. Do you not know that all of these qualities that Paul just mentioned are found in Jesus? Jesus was humble. Jesus was certainly forgiving, was he not? No, notice the next thing. Jesus uh, had a heart of compassion. He was kind. He was gentle and patient. Everything Paul just mentioned is seen in the life of Jesus Christ. Well, the point is, if you believe that Jesus is all in all and he is sufficient for your life, if salvation, salvation which brings transformation, if that is true, then every quality and characteristic in Christ must be exemplified in your life. 
That's why he says we're striving, we are being renewed every day into the image of the one who saved us, right? Or who created us. So that image means, that image has to do with all of these qualities and characteristics that Paul just mentioned. And then he says, I, I didn't get to it, I didn't really deal with it, but when he talks about being renewed into a true knowledge, what well, here is what Paul really means. Paul is saying to them, the, the more you know about Jesus, the more you are transformed in Jesus. You cannot be, you will not be transformed if you don't know him. So the more you know about Jesus, now notice, I didn't say the more you, uh, you feed the hungry. I didn't say the more you visit the nursing home, all of those things are fine. I didn't say the more you, um, you pass the collection trade or you work on the, in the worship service. That's not what, I, the more you know Jesus, the more you are transformed every day. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, I'll do you one better. I'll mess up your theology. He didn't even say the more you come to church. Because see, some people think the more I come to a, a worship assembly, then I'm transformed. No, you cannot be transformed in, a, in an hour. It takes a daily, lifelong process until the Lord calls you home. So just because you've come to the worship assembly doesn't mean you're being transformed. Y'all hear what I'm saying? And then you got to put on these things. Now, am I saying there's something wrong with you? Am I saying now, on live streaming, when you get a chance, when the Lord blesses you, make sure you come in the building. I am not saying to y'all who are in the building that Fred said, look, I, I can stay home as long as, that's not what I'm saying. I understand we're in a pandemic, don't get me wrong. But what I am saying is, just because you come in here doesn't necessarily mean you have been transformed. Transform, my dear friends, mean I am making an intentional effort to put on kindness, to put on love, to put on forbearance, right? Being able to, boy, can, I'm trying. Could you imagine how forbearing Jesus is with us? Uh, sometimes he just looks at poor Fred and says, Lord, just be patient with him. And sooner or later, he'll get it. Forbearance, right? Yep, he slipped up again, Father. But that's why I died for him. Yes. Isn't that right? Isn't that the beauty of it? Listen, if there's someone who uh, uh, would like to say yes to Jesus, then I would urge you to come because he is the only one who is sufficient enough to save you and keep you safe. Jesus is sufficient, church. And I urge you, I would, I would encourage you to come and say yes to him. Right? Say yes to the one who will keep you safe. He did, I'm thankful Jesus never said in the Bible that when you come to me, you keep you safe. No, Jesus is sufficient for all of us. No matter what you go through, no matter what I go through, no matter what we're facing, anything, no matter how difficult it is, Jesus is sufficient to get you through it. You say yes to him. Believe that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And be immersed into him. Be immersed. And remember, I'm going right back to Colossians 2. When he says be immersed, baptized into him, guess what happens? God operates. He says by faith it is the operation of God and you believe that God will cut away the sins of the flesh. When you're immersed into him. If you need to respond, I pray that you do so as we stand and we sing the Heaven's Invitation song.